Um, my name is Judy Scott. I'm a retired professor in the education department from the University of California at Santa Cruz. And I'm an author of this book, When the Mission Bells Rang. Um, I wrote it and Lydia Gibson illustrated it. So I'm going to read it now for the Park Service. First, this book is dedicated to the Awaswas and the Amamutsun people who inhabited the northern region of the Monterey Bay for thousands of years before the Europeans arrived. It's also dedicated to the educators who strive to bring an indigenous perspective about the missions to their students. Tong, tong, tong. Mission Santa Cruz tested the new mission bells that hung above the white building. Tong, tong, tong. The mission priests and the other Moonies liked the loud sound. And I'm going to interrupt for a minute and tell you that the words in here, like Moonis, are words that are used by the Amamutsun tribal band, and so I used them in my book. Tong, tong, tong. The bells were brought by ship to the Monterey Bay and hauled up the hill to the mission in a horse-drawn cart. Now the priests could regulate the time and schedules of everyone living in and around the mission, including the Amamutsun people who were held as captives. Tong, tong, tong. The ringing echoed around the bay, disturbing the people and the animals. Oris erupted from his cozy bed of tree limbs and hit his head on the top of the cave. Arg! he shouted. Who dares to awaken me from my peaceful sleep? Tamala sprung from her cave, ready to fight the noisy intruder. Who dares to make such an awful racket? Where are you? Dia leapt from his nest high up in the pines and soared over the marshes and the meadows. He searched for the enemy who made such an ear-splitting sound. Rena ran as fast as she could to the safety of her den and mother. As they huddled together shaking, she thought, it must be some kind of monster. Maybe it has fangs and has come to eat us all. And Seacock slowly popped his head out of the ground and grumbled, What now? Everyone could hear the sound of the bells for miles and miles. Tong, tong, tong. The bells rang out when the sun rose, when the sun was highest in the sky, and when the sun set, every single day. It was constant clanging that upset the peaceful valley and made it hard to concentrate. One day, Oris had enough. He called the Council of Animals together. We have to make this stop, he said. I want to sleep. All the animals agreed, but what could they do? They had discovered that the sound came when the priests pulled the bell's ropes. Should I do that again? <gasps> Humunya told the others, I tried to urge the priests to stop the noise by speaking to them while they sleep, but they don't listen. The Amamutsun people always hear me when I send them a dream, a dream message. Perhaps we can send a message to the priests through the Amamutsun people suggested Asit. I tried that too, Humana sighed. They said that the bells rule their, lives of the, rule their lives at the mission. When they get up, when to eat, when to work, and when to come back from the fields, they have to obey or they're punished. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm tired of it, grumbled Oris. I'll go down there myself. Maybe they'll pay attention if they know everyone hates the sound. Oris rambled towards the large white building. When he got close, 
The Moonists jumped up and shouted. They rang the bells louder and louder. Instead of listening to Oris, they pulled out their ratatats and started firing. Oris yelped when a bullet grazed his shoulder. The pain was worse than 500 bee stings. Suyu packed Oris's wound with herbs and kelp to help it heal. The animal tried to think of another way to stop the clanging of the bells. I know, said Assyrian. What if we build nests inside of them? That would stop the clappers from making such a racket. The animals agreed it was worth a try. Asirin and her sisters gathered reeds, rocks, grasses, and soft feathers. Unfortunately, there was no way to anchor the nests inside the smooth, curved metal. The reeds, roots, grasses, and feathers rained down on the moonus. Discouraged, the sparrows returned to the council. Again, the animals thought and thought. Finally, Rena said, I know I'm small, but I'm persistent. I'm going to gnaw the ropes that the priests pull. None of the animals could come up with a better plan, so Rena scampered to the mission and climbed high into the bell tower. For seven days and seven nights, she gnawed. Finally, with one last bite, the ropes slid to the ground. There was no way to ring the bells that morning. The animals cheered the peaceful silence. The only sounds they heard were the ocean and the wind blowing through the trees. They rejoiced, congratulated Rena, and went home. But the priests found some old clothes and blankets and tore them into strips. They wove together makeshift poles until the new ropes arrived from Mexico. One of the younger priests climbed up and attached them. The next week, Rena and her sisters gnawed through those stand-in ropes. The priests made the Amamuts and women weave new ropes, but they hated the bells as much as the animals did, so they created weak spots as they wove. Every time a new rope pole was attached, another mouse started gnawing. This continued for many, many years. It didn't completely stop the bells, but each delay felt like a small victory. <laughs> then one day, the earth rumbled and shook so violently that the entire bell tower toppled to the ground. It was never replaced. The bells were no more. By then, though, more Moonis and other people had moved into the valley. The sounds of blacksmith shops, gunfire, awful music, and other sounds were constant. Then, a train whistle blew. Sikat slowly popped his head out of the ground and grumbled. What now? And then there are four pages that say, think about it, talk about it, that talk about um, how the Amamutsun lived before the colonizers came and about what they ate. And then also a dictionary with the Amamutsun words and their translation into English.